welcome here at Dialogue. Please help yourself to a cup of coffee or tea or Milo and a piece of milk tart or apple tart. Thank you, Amanda. You can thank Amanda for that. She provided the snacks. Um, yeah, if you are watching online, then you're missing out on milk tart tonight. So <laughs> be here next time. Um, if you can. I mean, if you're sitting in George, then that's fine. Um, but yeah, welcome to everyone that is here. Uh, if, if this is your first time, I don't see any first timers, but maybe you haven't heard this. Um, and that is our motto. I'd li like to share that with you. Uh, we say dialogue is a, um, a community, now I'm forgetting it completely. We engage. I was like, we're a community that, <laughs> but I'm forgetting the verb. We engage the hearts and minds of um, the relevance of Christ, um, spiritually, culturally, and socially. Um, so one part of that is uh, we, in general, like to read or listen to podcasts or um, things like that. So we have a library there at the back. Uh, maybe you've seen it. Maybe you thought it's part of the decor. Um, it's, it's not. It's for you to enjoy the books there. So we've got some new books there um, and some that's just been there from forever. So like the Bible um, and some others. So please have a look there. And if you do want to borrow one, you're welcome to. You can just tell me or Gior if you take one. Um, we have a list and we can just put it on our list and know that the book is with you. Um, yeah, so please have a, have a look at the library if you want to. Um, are there any birthdays <laughs> can this week or the past week? Um, if you know Rechard and if you have his number, he had, has his birthday on Friday, coming Friday. Um, so you can congratulate him. And the reason I know that is because he filled out the Google form. Um, so please fill out the Google form, then we can know when it's your birthday. Um, and yeah, the, the form is on the WhatsApp group. Um, if you want to be on the WhatsApp group, there's a QR code at the back you can scan. Um, yeah, and then you can hear from us some more. All right then, oh, I just want to mention this. Um, some of you might know Nico de Jong, the one who mo moved to France. Um, so that's not Nico and Iris, that's Nico and Marty, that Nico. Uh, his father passed away this past week. So if you have his number, um, please yeah, drop him a message or give him a call um, and we will think of him also during this time. All right, um, before we start with the announcements, I would like to ask Gior. Gior was, this, this week we sent him to Potschestrom for the Rosh Christi Symposium. Um, and we are very jealous that you were there, but we are very glad that you, are th you were there. So yeah, please just come and give us some feedback and what stood out for you. Good evening. So, whoa, it was a week's lecture, so it's an impossible task. But um, I was thinking I'm going to an apologetics ministry conference. It's Rasu Christi, Reason for Christ. Um, but thinking on a Dialogue's mission that we say we engage minds with the relevance of Christ. And that is a big part of apologetics. It's not just ideas. I, I quickly just want to read for us 2 Corinthians uh, 10 uh, verse 4 and 5. Uh, for the weapons of our warfare are not of the flesh, but have divine power to, de, uh, to destroy strongholds. We destroy arguments and every lofty opinion raised against the knowledge of God and take every thought captive to obey Christ, being ready to punish every disobedience when your obedience is complete. And it's this, it is this what I came to experience there. It, uh, it's, it's more than just... Um, um, an esoteric conference and we're speaking about high things and you think these things being irrelevant but being there I saw relationships and I saw how truth cuts through and changes people and that is exactly what we need and in that in that mouth or in that same breath I want to say um, equip yourself uh, Rashi Christie is such a good ministry 
And if you have any friends with difficult questions, or you yourself struggle to, to think on how to deal with certain things, go and visit Rosh Yukrasi. They are on Wednesdays, and uh, definitely it's a place to, um, to, to be a Christian and be a light in this world, and not just sound like uh, copycat dumb stuff. You actually understand why the world work at, works as it works. Engage with the world, you engage with yourself and others. Um, so yeah, that's what I can say. Thank you, Kyur. Yeah, so you might know Daniel Maritz. Um, he is the head of the chapter here in, in Pretoria. So um, if you want more information about Rashi Christi, please speak to, to us or to Gyur. Okay, let's look at the announcements for this evening. First one, most important one, is the camp. Um, so the details you can get, um, there's a Google form that you can fill out to register. Um, I just want to clarify the fees, uh, is it's for the whole camp. It's not per day per person, it's for the camp per person. Um, yeah, so please, please, please join us for the camp. I think it's really going to be um, a lot of fun and a great way to get to know the other people in, in the church and so on. So join our camp in September. Then next up we have the book club. Um, here's the, the book again uh, that we're going to read. You can still sign up. We're starting not this week, but the week after. Um, and uh, yeah, the, the part that I read now, I started reading. The, the last thing I read um, was where Bonhoeffer speaks about Christian community and he calls it an ideal, not an ideal, but a divine reality with which he means um, you have to be, it's a necessity that you are part of a Christian community. It is, <laughs> it is how it is if you are a Christian. Um, and the sooner we get disillusioned by people around us uh, and the leaders, the better, because then we can start being part of the real community um, that God that's part of his model for, for his people. So that's just a, a sneak peek into chapter one. Um, but please join us for the book club. It's for six weeks, Thursday evenings, an hour on Zoom. So speak to me if you want to join us. Then tutoring, the next date, is 13th of August. So this is our, our big monthly outreach. Um, yeah, so please consider coming if you are available on that Saturday afternoon. Tabang is sitting there at the back. Tabang, maybe if you can just raise your hand. So please speak to him. Um, if you want more information or want to hear uh, and, and be encouraged to go <laughs> um, and get your fears set aside, please go and speak to him. He will convince you that it's not hard, um, but th that it's very uh, fulfilling to, to do that. 13th of August. Then our quiz night, 19 August. Um, it will be our first in-person quiz night post-COVID. <laughs> so you'll remember that quiz night was very, uh, we did it very regularly during COVID because it's a, a nice online event as well. But this one is going to be in person on the Friday evening, 19th of August. So get your team together or just come and we will um, put together the teams here and um, yeah, join us for a fun evening of trivia on the 19th of August. All right. Then, um, before... Mm, oh, yes. Before we go into the sermon, I wanted to mention on Tuesday we're having a big cell. So all our cells, uh, cell groups will be coming um, here on Tuesday evening. If you are not in a cell, you're still welcome to also join if you want to check out the people who go to cells. Um, they are basically the ones that are sitting around you <laughs> as well. Um, so yeah, please join us if you want to. Tuesday evening, 7.30, um, and we'll eat hot dogs together and um, read the Bible together and so on. So please tell me if you want to join, then we can just make sure that we have enough food for everyone. And that's this coming Tuesday, 6.30. All right. Then, um, before I go into prayer, um, I would like to read the text that Johan will be um, looking at tonight. So he's talking about the bronze snake. What's up with the bronze snake? 
So if you have your Bibles, please open up with me in Numbers. We'll be reading from Numbers and then also from John, the Gospel according to John. So Numbers chapter 21. Um, I'd like to also mention at the back there are Bibles, so if you, you're most welcome to go and pick up a Bible there um, and use it for the service and put it back there for next week if you if you want to. Numbers chapter one, uh, 21, verses 4 to 9. Let's read from the word of the Lord. From Mount Hor they, they set out by the way to the Red Sea to go around the land of Edom. And the people became impatient on the way. And the people spoke against God and against Moses. Why have you brought us up out of Egypt to die in the wilderness? For there is no food and no water, and we loathe this worthless food. Then the Lord sent fiery serpents among the people, and they bit the people, so that many people of Israel died. And the people came to Moses and said, We have sinned, for we have spoken against the Lord and against you. Pray to the Lord that he take away the serpents from us. So Moses prayed for the people. And the Lord said to Moses, Make a fiery serpent and set it on a pole, and everyone who is bitten, when he sees it, shall live. So Moses made a bronze serpent and set it on a pole. And if a serpent bit anyone, he would look at the bronze serpent and live. And then you can turn with me to John, John 3, and we'll read verses 13 to 16. John 3, 13 to 16. No one has ascended into heaven except he who descended from heaven, the Son of Man. And as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness... So must the Son of Man be lifted up, that whoever believes in him may have eternal life. For God so loved the world that he gave his only Son, that whoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. All right, let's pray together. Let's close our eyes. Lord Jesus, Thank you for the privilege of coming together as a community. Thank you that we can worship you in, in the open and pray and be together and read and preach from your word and speak about you and not fear persecution. Thank you, Lord, that you, that you provide. Thank you that you guide us through life, through all our questions and all our uncertainties. And thank you that you give us the little joys of life as well, good food and good company and good music and beautiful art and sunsets and nature and all the other things in life that we can enjoy. Lord, I pray I pray this evening for Niku who lost his dad during the week. Lord, I pray that you will be with him and Mati and with his family. Yeah, Lord, that, you, that they will get to know you in a, in a deeper way during this time of loss. That they will turn to you with their suffering. Lord, I, I pray for everyone else in our community as well, those who are ill that you will heal them, those who are looking for jobs that you will provide for them, those who are lonely that you will, that you will comfort them, that you will be a companion to them and also send them companions. Lord, and, and all the other needs and, and yeah, hard things that we are going through, Lord, that you will be present in them. Lord, I also pray for this evening that you will touch us, that you will touch our hearts and our minds, that we will, that we will not go home the same person that, that we came here as. 
but that you will change us, Lord, and change us to be more like, like your son, and show us where we are not walking in the footsteps of Christ yet. Convict us, Lord. Also, as we, as we will be having communion later, I pray that that you will bind us as a congregation closer to each other and that yeah that you will also individually convict us of of our sins lord i pray that you will be with Johannes as he brings the word lord and that we will have clarity about things that you will lift the veil from our eyes And Lord, as we now go into a time of worship as well, we join with the church all over the world and with the believers from all generations and through the ages. And we join the, the song of the angels in heaven, Lord, and we praise your name, you who are holy and, and glorious. Lord, we... We want to lift up your praise tonight. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Amen. All righty. Good evening, everybody. Good evening, good evening. We're a nice uh, intimate group, <laughs> so I think we can uh, kill the lights. Thanks, G. You're on top of it. Thank you very much. All right, so if you guys would stand to your feet, join us in worship. Thank you so much.
Cause I shine in all the stars in glory Cause your love is like the wildest ocean Cause oh, nothing else compares
All right, good evening, guys. Hey, I, I want to thank these musicians uh, for really singing their hearts out, even though, uh, you know, it's, it's not necessarily sort of the hill song turnout. Um, and uh, I appreciate that. And also, I love the milk tart there at the back. I think Amanda is responsible for it. And um, that, is, that is worth your admission right there. Um, so thanks for that, guys. Uh, I'm hoping that you guys remember the, uh, the story that, 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 that Anna read for us um, from Numbers 21 and then Jesus' brief interpretation of that. Um, but it is a bizarre story, is it not? It is a very, very bizarre story. And it is wrong for a number of reasons. Let me just run through a couple of them. One is, it seems like a little bit of an overkill. And the pun is intended there. Uh, uh, I mean, they are moaning about their limited dietary options. And, and then this punishment ensues. The snakes appear. Now, I have complained a lot about food in my life. Um, but I've complained. Not, not, to my wife is a pretty decent cook. My mom was rubbish. Um, and I, I, I regularly complained about it. But never did she ever say, unleash the serpents. Um, you know, our, our, our family, although it was quite and is quite dysfunctional, it wasn't that dysfunctional. So it seems a little bit like an overkill. These people are complaining about food. Snakes appear. Boom. The second thing is that idolatry seems to be wrong in every page of the Bible. And a couple of... Uh, weeks ago, I think two weeks ago, there was a sermon about the golden calf and the fact that the golden calf is a bad idea. You shouldn't do that. You shouldn't make an image of, um, of God. You shouldn't worship it. And now all of a sudden, you have a bronze snake and it seems like they are at least looking at it. There's some sort of worship towards it. Why is that okay now? So that is the second thing that doesn't make sense. The third thing is, why a snake? I thought a snake is the bad guy. Um, in Leviticus 11, snakes, you're not allowed to eat snakes, which I think is, is, is still in practice. And uh, you, um, in, in the Garden of Eden, a snake is not a good guy. Now all of a sudden, the snake is the thing that heals you. What is up with the bronze snake? Again, a little bit of a pun intended. So if we want to understand this very tricky passage, we need to just be a little bit more humble and realize that we are busy with an ancient text. And we're going to need help. And we're going to need help from people who really know how to read these, these ancient stories. Before I get there, though, I want to just make a, a, a little... Mm, I just want to put something on the shelf here. And that is, we've spoken about it plenty of times at Dialogue before. But for at least three centuries or so, there's this philosophical idea that humans are basically good. It's just our societies that's let, let us down. It's just our systems which let us down. So basically humans are good. Basically humans are kind. Um, but because you've got systems like uh, capitalism or communism, patriarchy, um, whiteness, uh, uh, gender normativity, n name it what you will, because of all of these systems, humans become corrupted through these things. But they are basically good. And that ideology came crashing down in the beginning of the 20th century because people were very excited about technology. They were very excited about solving all of our issues with each other. And then what we did is we used our technology and we created the atom bomb and we just killed people much quicker than we were able before. So the 20th century was just this massive wake-up call that there's something wrong with us. I am, however, somewhat sad to report that, that people seem to be going back now to this idea, I, I say some intellectuals are now very excited about the idea that humans are basically good. That, however, is not the biblical idea. The Bible says a lot about humans. It says that we are made in the image of God. It says that we've got the spark of divinity inside of us. It says that we've got incredible dignity. It says that we are capable of incredible a lot of goodness and a lot of creativity, um, but 
it also says that there's something fundamentally wrong with humans. All right. Now, in the New Testament, what you often get is a principle. You will get a principle mainly through a guy like the Apostle Paul who will give you a principle, a theological principle. In the Old Testament, you don't have principles, you have pictures. So this is one lens that I think we need to pick, put on if we want to make sense of, of this passage. The Old Testament gives you a picture where the New Testament gives you a, a principle. So this story of the brazen snake is this vivid picture of what goes on in the human heart. All right. Let's, let's try and unpack that story a little bit. Manna. Manna is this, this thing that fell from the sky that God provided so that this massive group of people can survive in a desert that cannot sustain life, definitely not for thousands. There are a couple of options if you want to get geographically from Cairo or from, from Egypt to, to Israel. There is an option to go along the coast, and there's a little bit more vegetation, but unfortunately, there are a little bit more tribes as well. And these guys would have been, uh, and, and were, very hostile to the Israelites. So God decided to take them through the desert, but that meant there's no way for them to get any food, there's no civilization, there's nothing. And he provides for them uh, miraculously in the form of manna, which is this powdery substance that fell from the sky that was unambiguously a miracle that they would collect and they would make different foods from this. I would say it is like a, a and, and this is not a scientific opinion, but it's a little bit like soya today, in the sense that you can make anything out of soya. I am always amazed about how you get soya fill in the blank. And, um, and, and I'm, as a matter of fact, I think the milk tart might be soya milk tart there. Uh, who knows? But they, they would pick up this manna and they would just use it in a variety of ways to prepare dishes for themselves. And it was, like I said, God's provision. It was timely. It was literally the thing that was keeping them alive. It was uh, miraculous. And what does, uh, what, what, what do we hear from the Israelites? We loathe this worthless manna. We loathe this, wor- this, this, this worthless ma- food. There's another story in the Bible where a snake is involved. There's another story in the Bible where a snake is involved and humans are a little bit discontent with their limited menu. Can anybody tell me where that is? The Garden of Eden, all right? So I think this story is trying to remind us of the Garden of Eden. Here you've got a snake, snakes, again, and you've got people moaning about the amount of food that they are getting or the lack thereof or the lack of variety. And then in the Garden of Eden, again, we've got these two humans and, and they are, it seems, discontent with their, their limited food options. Here's something interesting. The, the story of the Garden of Eden is obviously one where they had everything. It was paradise. And a serpent comes in and he says, so what's going on here? And Adam and Eve says, it's amazing. It's paradise. We can eat whatever we want. We've got, we can play in that tree. We can swim there. We can eat this. We can eat this. Um, and, and, then, and then the serpent asks, everything? Oh, well, I mean, there's that one knowledge of good and evil. We're not allowed to go there. But that's it. And the serpent says, and you're satisfied with this situation? It seems very tyrannical, seems very totalitarian. What on earth is, 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 is going on? And all of a sudden, the, the human and the humans become unsatisfied, become discontent, and sin creeps into this world. It is this chronic discontent dissatisfaction with our circumstances. It is this fear of missing out and that God is holding something back from us that, that we actually need. And the picture that you guys need to understand, if there's one thing that you walk away with uh, tonight, I hope it's this, that with the hearts we have, without a supernaturally transformed heart, you can be in the Garden of Eden 
and still find something to be discontent about. You can be in paradise, and with our hearts, we will find something to moan, complain, rebel against. That is what these two stories are telling us about the nature of sin, the nature of humans, as a matter of fact. I am not on Facebook regularly, and I realized many sentences start like that. Um, it's a little bit like, you know, I, I don't drink, um, but okay, I'm, I'm not on Facebook regularly, but this one time I'm on Facebook. And I see that there's a picture of our class of, I don't know what it was, 2000, 2004, somewhere, somewhere, somewhere there. And the, the heading says, the good old days. And I look at it and say, oh, okay, there we go, the good old days. Yeah, it was fun or whatever. And then as I reflected on that, a couple of things struck me. The first one was the girl who posted it with the heading, the good old days, absolutely hated school. I know this because I sat next to her in lower grade mathematics for at least five years. So, 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 so she is... She, she was really not excited about, about school. When she was in school, she just desperately wanted to get out of school. But it seems now that she's out of school, she just desperately wants to get back into school. And as you look through the faces there, and you look at yourself, and you look at other people, then there's something that you, that you might recognize, and that is, man, I looked so much better back then. You know, hey, imagine that. Um, and just young and, 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 uh, and, and, and whatnot. Who of you have ever looked at all the photos of yourself and thought, oh, the good old days? Anyone? Yeah. Okay. And the rest of you guys are liars. Uh, here's the thing. If you think about it hard enough, this is what you would realize. When that picture was taken, you were probably not very content at how you looked at the time. You were insecure back then as well, especially if it's a picture of you being a teenager in high school. You were super insecure about how you presented yourself, um, your looks, your intelligence, your status, whatever the case may be. So here's the thing. We are now looking back into this, this school photo and we are finding something to, to be nostalgic about. Yet, in the time that the picture represents, we were, we were unhappy. We were probably just w wishing that we can get out of school so we can be grown up, so that we can do our own thing. Can you see there's something wrong in the human heart? We are unsatisfied back then. We are unsatisfied now. And this struck me really hard this week for a number of reasons. I, um, I was away now for a, for a long time. We, we do these tours, and it's one of the ways in which I'm able to finance um, myself and... Uh, and I, a lot of people are jealous when they, because I see the world and I, I guess there is an exciting element to it. But if you press me, I will probably tell you that I am a glorified chaperone. I'm a babysitter for teenagers in Europe whilst I show them where is the cheapest places to shop, okay? Uh, so so it's, it's, it's not necessarily very, uh, very glamorous. And when I was there now, I just wanted to get back into South Africa so badly. Uh, I think I told you when I, when I just arrived and you just saw the cold, ugly East Rand, it just felt so homely to me. I just, I just thought, oh, thank God, I'm back. And I just kissed you know, the ground and everyone else. And, uh, and I'm, I'm here and I'm trying to sort of get back into the rhythm of things. And somebody asked me, how, how are you doing? And I, I find myself saying, you know what? I kind of miss the routine of the tour. The fact that you know exactly what needs to happen, I need to get up, I need to get those people there, I need to call that bus, I need to explain that to them. I sort of miss the, the hustle of the tour. And there it is again. When I was on it, I couldn't wait to get back into South Africa. Now that I'm in South Africa, there's something in me, uh, you know, if, if I'm not concentrating, I'm Googling something um, about Europe. Um, you know, when, when, when I'm not, not focusing, there's this uh, weird nostalgia. I find myself not just talking about um, the tours in such an uncharitable fashion. I found myself on numerous occasions thinking of church, thinking of dialogue as, 
Well, this is basically me preaching a message to a glorified cell group that they will forget within 24 hours, okay? Or what about the development stuff that we do, you know, in, in terms of townships or whatever? Well, we're trying to make one guy a little bit less poor than his neighbor, but it's definitely not going to make a dent in the bigger scheme of things. I have thought of these things, and, and this is what I'm keeping myself busy with, on numerous occasions. I'm afraid I have to admit that. And here's the thing. These are just different versions. Well, I just described how I experience my life sometimes. It is actually just a different version of we loathe this worthless manna. It's just a different version of these Israelites who are looking at a divine gift and saying it is absolutely worthless. The way that I look at tours and church and development is stupid, stupid, and stupid. This chronic dissatisfaction, this chronic discontent. I wonder if some of you guys can identify with that when you, when you think of your respective jobs and maybe there's something very monotonous about it or maybe you feel a little bit stuck. You, you have this discontent towards it. What lies behind this, friends? What did the serpent say to get us so unsatisfied, so discontent? Well, I mean, a variety of the following. He says that, does God really have your best interests at heart? What is he hiding from you? Maybe there's something that he's hiding, perhaps. He's telling you that maybe you must reach out for something and take, take that, and then you will be satisfied. The point that I'm trying to make is that distrust in God's provision and discontent is closely connected. To see something as a gift from God and to be unsatisfied they are very closely connected. Let me give you a couple of other examples of what this might play out, uh, how this may, may, may play out. The serpent's questions in, in different ways. Um, maybe you feel like, hmm, you know what, it's my money. I can do with it what, is, what, what I want. I know the Bible says that we need to be generous. I know the Bible says that we must give and we must give till it hurts, et cetera, et cetera. But you know what? Um, I, I think it's just hiding something from me. The good life is just on the other side of that purchase that I need to make there or this experience that I need to buy for myself. You, you question God when he gives you this command. Another example would be in terms of describing God's view on sexuality, not on sexuality, but on, on these sexual commands as being very restricting, very totalitarian. Um, what is he hiding from me? Um, I, if, if I do that, I will have this euphoric experience. I must just indulge myself in that. And as soon as you think that, this discontent creeps in. You start to question God. You start to question his provision. And it doesn't make sense for you to wait or, or anything like that. So what happens? Fiery serpents come into the camp. Why, why are they fiery serpents? Were they literally on fire? We heard a couple of weeks ago about the burning bush, this, the story of the burning snakes. No, but what we do know about these snakes, the snakes in, the, in, in that area, is when they bit you, you got this insatiable thirst. It was almost impossible to quench that thirst. It really put your insides on fire, basically. And you, the, the only way to try and... Uh, the only remedy is water, but you can never get enough of that. And in the desert, it's, it's not necessarily in oversupply. So they developed this unquenchable thirst. Here's what we need to understand, friends. This is again a picture, a physical picture, of what is happening to us spiritually. There's that song in The Greatest Showman where that lady says, Never enough. Never, never, never enough. Never, never, never enough for me. Never enough. I can go on and on and on. And, 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 and that is, again, also a, a very vivid picture of what goes on in our hearts. Always unsatisfied. Never enough. Never enough. Never enough. Friends, uh, none of us here are celebrities. 
But you know who experienced this the most? Are the celebrities. They are desperate. They think that if they can just get that contract, that movie, that whatever, and they've got this chronic dis and discontent and if you if you read their stories it is one tragedy after the next and a lot of it has to do i think with this spiritual condition that we suffer from it seems like israel gets it they they get that this picture that was given to them the is is uh, is what is going on in their lives spiritually and they immediately repent they immediately repent which by the way is a good start if you want the healing of of Jesus then you have to understand if you have or rather you have to admit that there's something wrong with you otherwise you can't get his healing so when he says I didn't come for the healthy I came for the sick he's basically saying I came for the people who realize that they are a mess who realize that they suck and that they are in need of of divine grace so the first step is to admit not to make excuses not to make accusations not to say but I still think that you overreacted no to admit that there is something wrong with us, a chronic discontent, a chronic suspicion. And then, what's the remedy? Put a snake on a pole. How bizarre. Put a snake on the pole. What are you supposed to do? Rub the snake three times? Climb the pole? No, just look at it. Look at the snake on the pole and you will be healed. What's going on there? You need to read fairy stories to understand this. There's a huntsman in many fairy stories. And uh, there's a village. And the village is just terrorized by a vampire or a werewolf or some sort of monster. Okay? They call the huntsman, please save the village. And what does the huntsman do? He hunts. He gets the monster. He decapitates the monster and then they put the monster's head on the stick and, you say, and, and he walks into the town and he says guys you can relax order is restored here's the monster here's the vampire here's the werewolf a monster's head on a stick is a dead monster and it immediately means that there is order that can be restored back into the community we can, we can uh, again live in in harmony. This is not just something that you read in fairy stories. As a matter of fact, this is what, what happened um, in various wars over and over the centuries, is that if you've just conquered a particular king or a particular general, head on the stick, um, guys, the fight is over. We've conquered. We've, 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 we've got this guy. We've won. What God is saying is that he has the power to destroy the snake and what the snake represents. By putting it on a stick, it is saying, I can destroy this terrible sin. The sin that creates this unquenchable, constant discontent, this constant suspicion, this constant thirst. I can destroy it. It remains a very bizarre passage. Jesus, however, sheds a lot of light on it when he picks it up in John 3. He says, just as the serpent was lifted up in the desert, so the Son of Man must be lifted up in the desert. A lifted up serpent is a dead serpent. A lifted up Son of Man is a dead Son of Man. Now here's where it gets crazy, but, but also beautiful. Jesus somehow embodies the serpent. When he is lifted up on that cross, he becomes the seed of that serpent. He becomes sin itself. He dies as the serpent. And I know this is very strange and it's very difficult for us to, to understand. But this is exactly what Paul is saying in 2 Corinthians 5. He says, For our sake he made him to be sin who knew no sin, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. Let me read that again. For our sake, he made him to be sin who knew no sin, so that in him he might become the righteousness, we might become the righteousness of God. On the cross, you have that, that very tragic line where Jesus says, I thirst. 
And it's almost as if he is experiencing this thing that is in our souls just to the most extreme degree. That insatiability that we can never quench. Jesus dies that death. He represents that. There's this wonderful parable, I say wonderful, but it's actually terrible, um, of, of Lazarus and the rich man, where this rich man is, is sending Lazarus to just dip his, his finger in water and just, just, just give him a drop of water because he is on fire in this place. And we've spoken about hell before, but l- let me just say this. If you do not nip this thing in the bud, if you do not now already ask God to intervene in your life, to do a heart transplant, that discontent will just continue into eternity. It is a flame that can never be, uh, n- never be quenched. It can never be extinguished. And if you do that for eternity, eventually there will be no you left even. That's the picture that we have of the rich man there in, in hell. He's burning up. Don't over-literalize that image. He is burning up, discontent. Jesus becomes that on the cross. How are we healed? We just look at him. We just look at the lifted up Jesus. The elevated snake is what they had to look at in the wilderness. The lifted up Jesus is what we have to look at now. If you look at Jesus, what do you see? Maybe this is an image that might help you. Whom of you have seen the movie The Exorcist? It was a movie made in 1973. Won the Oscar that year. I remember it like yesterday. No. Uh, 1973, The Exorcist. Anybody? Okay, well, it is... uh, I I know... um, what you call it? horror movies, it's not for everyone. I know a movie called The Exorcist might not be for everyone, but as far as these horror supernatural movies go, this is probably the original and this is probably the best, and it was the first time that the horror genre broke into the Academy Awards, all right? And it tells the story of a little girl called Reagan, and she is possessed, and man, oh man, is she possessed. I mean, there's amazing visuals for, you know, 1970s cinema. And they, they asked the help of a priest, one Dr. Damien Karras. And, and Father Karras is an interesting character because he's a priest, but he really doubts his faith, And maybe the reason why he doubts his faith is he recently finished his studies at Harvard University, and he uh, he goes to 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 try and uh, solve this problem from a psychological perspective. So for um, the majority of the film, he's actually skeptical as to whether this girl is truly possessed. I mean, how he can be skeptical looking at that girl um, is 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 a miracle in itself, but. But he goes and he's, he's constantly sort of very, he's very psychologist about his, 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 you know, even though he's dealing there with something supernatural. And uh, eventually he realizes that he needs help. So he calls in another priest, Father Mirren. And when Father Mirren just enters the house, this girl just lets out this squeal, Mirren. And uh, you know, oh, it's, it's, it's about to go down. So, so he's an established exorcist, and, and this is an established demon. And he, he goes up, and Father Karras, um, he, he, he tries to brief Mirren. He says, I think there are multiple personalities in her. And he says, no, there's only one personality in her. You can relax about that. He dismisses this you know, psychological mumbo-jumbo. And they pray for this girl, and they try their best, and she manifests, and it's, it's very vivid, and it's very scary. And in this struggle, Father Merrin, the old man, he has a heart attack, and he dies. And this Father Karras, having dealt with this situation now for, for an extended time, he is <laughs> he's obviously convinced by now, and he just appeals. He says, leave her, leave her. And then he says... Come into me instead. Leave her. Come into me. 
And as he's shaking this little girl, but at that stage, just a horrible demon, you see his eyes lighting up that this demon has shifted into him. And it looks kind of scary, like this is the beginning of where he becomes the bad guy. And then you just see this flicker of him still being Father Karras. It's still him, although the, the demon entered him. And what does he do? He hurls himself out of the window to fall to his death. And you see the girl, for the first time you see a little girl, not this monster crying in the corner. Her parents come and embrace her for the first time in weeks. For the first time they can embrace their, their child. They hug and they cry. These two priests die dead. I, I thought about that. Well, well sorry, let me, let me just finish the story. Right at the end, this family is moving away from this house for obvious reasons. And the family is happy. For the first time, people are happy in the story. And as they drive away, the little girl says, stop, stop, stop. And she sees a random priest walking by and she recognizes the clerical collar, the Roman collar. She just runs to him, hugs his leg, says thank you. Why did I think about that? Because you see, when Paul says Jesus became sin, he, he embodied it. It is as if Jesus invited evil to come into him and he hurled himself onto the cross and there gave evil this definitive blow. And what is the right response to that? It is the response of the little girl who just sees something that resembles that divine gift that she experiences. And she goes over and embraces him. Embraces it. That is what it means, I think, to look at the cross. To look. And I think also that is a very vivid image of God taking evil into himself, onto himself, holds himself on the cross, and there evil is defeated. There's something else in this passage that I find striking. In John 3, verse 13, it says that Jesus descended from heaven. The Son of Man descended from heaven to be lifted up on a pole. Friends, if you know anything remotely surrounding uh, Trinitarian theology, what we mean by that is that Jesus was infinitely happy in the bosom of the Father. He didn't need to come down here. He didn't need to die for us on the cross. He was super, super infinitely happy. But yet, he empties himself. He, go, he, he, he um, takes on the likeness of man. He goes on the cross. He's lifted up on this cross. Why? Why does he do that? Because the only thing he didn't have is us. And the irony is so stark because we are constantly discontent and constantly trying to reach up. In the meantime, God is coming down. He's descending we, when we are trying our best to ascend constantly. And there on the cross, he forgives. There on the cross, he deals with sin. And that is, friends, if you, if you want to make sense, sense of John 3, verse 16, this very famous passage, maybe that is a picture that you need to have in mind. For God so loved the world that he gave his only son. When I, they, they, well, let me say this. There, there's this group of uh, theologians collectively referred to as Mumford and Sons. And they, they write this song, which I relate to as a hymn of sorts. It's called I Will Wait. Some of you m uh, might be familiar with it. Those of you who are not can leave. Um, so, so they write this, this song, I Will, leave, uh, I will, <laughs> I will Wait. <laughs> And this is how it goes. It says, so break my step and relent. In other words, make me slow. You forgave and I won't forget. Now what we've seen and him with less, 
now in some way shake the excess. What he's saying there is that we're seeing Jesus on the cross. We see how he forgives, forgave. I cannot forget that. That's the first thing. And then as you see him descending, emptying himself, that in some way can transform my heart to shake this constant discontent, this constant excess. He goes on and he says, because I will wait for you. And now it goes over into worship. He says, I'll be bold as well as strong and use my head alongside my heart. And then he prays, so tame my flesh and fix my eyes, a tethered mind free from the lies. The lies of the serpent that is constantly trying to convince us that God is hiding something from us, that we um, are constantly missing out. And he goes on and he says, so I'll kneel down and I will wait for now. I'll kneel down, I'll know my ground. Raise my hands, paint my spirit gold, and bow my head, keep my heart slow. I will wait, I will wait for you. Friends, we're gonna go into communion now. Before we do that, however, I wanna invite you to just close your eyes for a second. And, and just do a bit of introspection. Maybe just identify those things that you are constantly discontent about. Maybe just identify those things, the manner that you are loathing in your own life. Things that if it's not stopped, if it's not nipped in the bud, will turn you into a grumpy person and will turn, will send you into hell if it is not, in, if, if, if there's no intervention. And friends, we take those struggles of ours and just look at the cross for a moment in your mind's eye. Look at Jesus. He forgave, we won't forget. Seeing him with less now in some way helps us to shake the excess. Just look at the cross. Jesus inviting evil into, into him so that we can be free. And allow that to transform you. Allow that to change your heart. Yeah, there's nothing that you have to do but to look and in the process of looking and looking well, be transformed. Friends, there's another reminder that we have so that we can look at the cross regularly and it can Indulge all the senses. Um, so what we're going to do now is, those of you who want to partake, you're welcome. We're going to take the bread and the cup. And you can just keep it with you for a second.
Friends, we must know that this is Jesus' body broken for you. Take it and remember. And this is my blood poured out for you. Take it and remember. Look. Lord Jesus, you... You didn't leave us in the wilderness. You didn't leave us in this constant state of discontent. You came for us. We thank you, Lord, that you came all the way to the cross, that you were lifted up, that you took the fall on our behalf. You hold yourself onto the cross and that evil was destroyed there. The penalty for it was paid. And I pray that that will transform our hearts. A lot of us are maybe struggling to to get out of this the space that we find ourselves in, constantly unsatisfied. And I, I pray, Lord, that the picture of you on the cross will transform our hearts. We need a heart transplant. And that's what we want to invite you to do now, Lord. Forgive us when we try all sorts of other avenues to to try and remedy this situation, to try and take control of our own lives, but we are not looking properly. Help us to look at the cross, to look at you lifted up, and to be transformed by it. We pray this in the name of Jesus Christ, and we know that that God so loved the world that he didn't, that he gave his only son so that all who believe in him may have eternal life. Thank you for that, Jesus. Amen. Okay. <clears throat> um, friends, I'm just going to give us a, a few minutes if there are questions or comments. And we can quickly discuss it if there's something that is uh, unclear or something that you would like to add. And then also feel free to you know, grab yourself a coffee or a bathroom or a milk tart. It sounds ugly in English, milk tart. <laughs> yes, Anya. Johan, thank you so much for the message. Really appreciate it. Um, I just want to have a quick comment um, where the, the movie had a, a sweet ending. I think it's just a good warning to hear the epilogue of the snake. Um, in the days of Hezekiah, the Israelites started worshipping the snake because it worked once, let's do it again. <laughs> just as a testament of how we really are excellent at making idols. Yeah. You don't need to make comments, just, yeah. Mm. So, I'm not sure if you guys heard that, but, uh, well, I mean, you heard it, but, but what, he, what Hanyu is referring to is in Second Kings, I need to find that passage, uh, but just trust me, in Second Kings, uh, you see that somehow they kept this bronze serpent 
and now people are worshipping it again for some reason because it worked once now hopefully it works again and then he destroys it and what's what, what i find interesting is that if you if you read uh the jewish accounts of of why they had to destroy it <laughs> they i i they, they struggle to make sense of it but what they do say you, you have this for example in the song of solomon which is not the, the, the book we have um, but uh, an ap 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 apocryphal um, a book and uh, of the old testament and they 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 say that it, it didn't have any saving power this 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 thing so to do not fall for it do not do not go into this this line of idols there's no superstition here there's nothing of rubbing it or looking at it or whatever it is still god doing this saving act it is still god it, it is a it is a way of saying that this is defeated um and also in the original passage they were never told to worship it they were never told to bow down to it they were never told to um, worship god as they look at the snake they were just supposed to look at it and be healed so uh, but one can understand i guess the ambiguity sur surrounding it it's very interesting yes daniel uh, thanks jan um to uh, kind of i guess a half point question and a question the the first being a part being I get your pictorial approach to the story, uh, you know, and the, the symbolism and metaphor of it makes sense. But, you know, we're past Genesis. E Exodus doesn't read to me in very mythological terms. And so you have to assume that this, this happened. And if you consider it from the point of view of history, it's still bloody weird. L like, you know, like if they're complaining about food, you know, it's like, take away the manna for three days, you know? See how, see how, it's like, how do you like your manna now? <laughs> you know, like, why snakes? <laughs> and um, the, uh, the second point I wanted to raise on this was, uh, God, it slipped my mind. <laughs> but just give me a second. Um, let's... Well, maybe as you think uh, about that, let me, let me try and make sense of it. So, uh, when I when I give you a a pictorial framework, when I say that we shouldn't over literalize this, I am I am not denying that this event happened. I am just I'm just saying that you shouldn't just look, miss the forest for the trees. The cross also happened. Does the cross mean that a first century Jew died on a stick? Yes. But it means way more than that. It represents far more than that. Yeah. So uh, people that are a lot sm smarter than I am, reading this text, trying to understand the meaning of it, they, they, they push us into this, um, let's say, spiritual reading of, of the text. But to me, it doesn't necessarily undermine the historicity of it. Yeah. Um, in terms of, was it an overkill? for God to send in the serpents. We still haven't, under, we, we, we still don't understand this, this message. Yeah. It is thousands of years later and we still have people convinced that we are basically fine. <laughs> um, we, the, 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 the Israelites forgot that message, you know, soon enough. Uh, it is a very vim vivid image of what is in the human heart. And um, if you want to, uh, if, if, if you want to get that across and you use the, th th these vivid images to try and get that across, I mean, I don't think, I don't think we've done a better job in trying to awaken people to this reality. Oh. Oh. And the, the second, you mentioned that when they looked on the snake, they repented. No, they repented and then they looked on the snake. They repented and then, well, it says the ones who believed God could save them or repented. But how do you, somebody might have thought, you know, in the middle of the chaos, like, oh crap, I've just gotten bit. Let me look at the snake, but come the evening, it's like, oh crap, man, her again. 
you know. Um, how do you know that that's more like a, <laughs> oh God, I don't want to die. Not, oh, I, w I was wrong about the mana. Mana's great. Like, I won't say anything bad about mana. <laughs> uh, remember, it's, they most definitely would have complained again. We see that all over this account. Miracle upon miracle upon miracle, and then they complain. They become completely delusional. Ah, oh, just, do you guys remember the, 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 the meat that we had in Egypt, how wonderful that was, you know? Yes, we were slaves. Yes, we were beaten. Yes, we were public property, but oh man, um, do I remember the cucumbers <laughs> of, 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 of Egypt. You know, they are completely delusional. So it takes a while, um, if not a lifetime, to get the slave out of Egypt. Even though it's easy to get the slaves out of Egypt, it's difficult to get the slave out of the slaves. Um, and uh, I, I think how, how they would have responded going forward, I, I don't know. What we do see is there's this line that says, we have sinned, for we have spoken against the Lord and against you. And in a text that's very economical with its, with its words, um, I, I think one can assume that uh, for a moment, they understood something, they realized something. They didn't play the game of, well, come on, man. That was, I mean, they didn't say three days without manna. How about that? Why the serpents? They just say, we've sinned. So it seems like they get, they get something of that. Just uh, Francine online posted a question. So oh. she asked, when or at what point can such a sin send you to hell? So that was her question. Okay. She, I, I guess she can't hear us now. Or are we still streaming? Oh, okay. Hello, Francine. Why aren't you here? Um, so, uh, it's not something that happens at a point. It's not something that, you know, we, <laughs> I don't want to go into, I don't want to open that can of worms, but when I was young, uh, I'm not sure if it's still a thing, people were very scared about what is the sin against the Holy Spirit. Oh dear, have I maybe committed the sin against the Holy Spirit? Is it, you know taking sweets from your friends, or what, what, what is it? And uh, it's this unforgivable sin. I don't think you should think of it as this once-off thing. Rather, it is, it is a path that you take in life. It is a posture that you have towards life and towards God. And it starts off by you complaining, and then... This is how C.S. Lewis puts it. He says, um, it all starts with a grumbling mood. And then eventually, there's nothing left but a grumble. So there's not a person grumbling anymore. You just have a grumbler. It's always interesting how cartoons depict these things. <laughs> you know, when they're a grumbling crowd. Well, after a while... If you do not allow this heart to be transformed, that's the only thing that is left, a grumble. And to, to also look at God and say, God, whatever you send me to wake me up to this spiritual reality is justified. Because I'm interested in that. I'm interested in eternal life. I'm interested in, in, in being with you eternally. So whatever you send, whatever you do to wake me up to this reality um, is good. I don't want the problem to disappear. I want the sin to disappear. And I, I think that is how you intervene, how you intercept this, this trajectory that is, that is in hell. I think, uh, I mean, uh, let, me, let me just briefly go to, to Luke 16, that, that passage of, of the rich man and Lazarus. You have this rich man, he is suffering, and people say, well, that's very unfair, how does it work? Just notice that rich man never repents. Never in that parable does he say, oh, God, I'm so sorry, I made so many mistakes. 
And now that I've seen the end result of th these mistakes, I want to come to you and I promise I will repent forever. You don't, you don't hear him saying that. He doesn't want to get out of hell. He only wants to get Lazarus into hell. He says, send Lazarus to get some water and bring it to me. Okay, that's the first thing you say. Then he also wants to warn his brothers. Now, what commentators say is, ah, this guy is very sneaky. He, that is just another way of saying, I didn't have enough evidence. I didn't have enough warning. Go warn my brothers. And then they say, um, then, then the guy says, well, maybe just send somebody from the dead. Then they will believe. And then Father Abraham says, they won't. They, 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 they won't believe in it. And, he, and he's not trying to be vindictive. So this guy is saying, I didn't have enough evidence. This guy is, is trying to get Lazarus in there. And never is this guy trying to repent and go to the other side. That is what's, what, what, what happens to our souls if, if it continues on this, on this path of infinite discontent. Anything else? Michelle. Um, this is just a thought. I'm not sure how um, substantial this is, but on the idea of, okay, weren't the serpents um, a little severe of a punishment? I'd say, I think the story in numbers, clearly, um, I think it did historically happen, but um, I would agree with you by saying like it, it's pointing to something. And I think the serpent isn't the only focus of the story. It's also what led to the fiery serpents being released. And that's that they, as you said, they rejected the manna. So in the New Testament, Christ says, he's the bread of life. He's the manna sent from heaven. And the New Testament makes it clear that if you reject him, if you despise him, then fire is the only thing waiting for you. And a lot of people say that's severe. God saying Christ is the only way. How intolerant, like how intolerant can you become? But it is what it is. So I think the serpent thing is just pointing to Jesus in this way as well. Mm. He's the only way. The manna is the only way to live. If you don't want it, then fire is what's waiting for you. I mean, it sounds harsh when you put it that way. Um, but, but I think you are 100% correct. And I think it's a wonderful line that you are drawing between Jesus and the manna and that he is the bread of life. Let me just put it in a slightly different way and just say this. If you do not get your bread of life from Jesus, you will get your bread of life from somewhere else. And you will try and get that life through your career, perhaps. Or you will try and get that bread of life through, uh, through your money or through your looks or through whatever it is. And those things will destroy you your job will at one point spit you out and say, retire. Or, um, and, and there will not be a massive hall of fame for you inside the building. And even if there's a massive hall of fame, maybe another politician um, is in charge and then you're not in the hall of fame anymore. Um, it, will, it will destroy you. If you, if, you, if you build your life, if you get your bread from something else, it can be something as good as your kids. You are this mother who, or this father who's just an incredible good, incredibly good father. Well, at some point, um, your kids are gonna move out the house, hopefully, and they are gonna uh, not wanna be with you anymore. They're not going to seek your counsel anymore. They're gonna be adults, they're gonna make decisions. And if that was your bread of life, it is going to destroy you. And these things, these little fires, and, and by the way, discontent is going to creep in. You're going to be a grumbler. I, man, I've seen a lot of that, by the way. It's old people, you know, my kids, they don't visit me, and, and it, it, it's terrible to see it. They, they in this, you know, uh, uh, what do you call that thing, a vortex, where it's just complaining, complaining, complaining. And they are already experiencing an element of hell. And it is God who comes in 
and says, you've been trying to find your bread at the wrong place. You must come to the cross. That is the only true source of, of food. So what one must understand of this fire is that in a, to a large extent, it is self-inflicted. It is what happens if we just take this natural course. You know? All right, let's end with uh, this. So, Gior. Okay. Thank you. Um, I, I'm just shamelessly going to promote the uh, Rosh Christie again. It's interesting. The, we had a day on cults, and we had a day on the occult. Uh, so there was sa Satanism, and there was um, a New Age, and there was critical theory, and there's all these ideas that people buy into. And the funny thing, if God is... Uh, if there's a void of God in your life, it will manifest somewhere else. And so in some sense, it is this manna thing all over again. Uh, in the highest philosophies, uh, you, will, you will just grab onto something that's not God, and the end of it is death. And so that was, I think, quite a theme for me throughout the conference. Whatever talk you were in, um, that was something there. And I think just secondary, um, the John text, I think, gives us the lanes. So if the, the text is weird, John helps us. It's so great that we have Jesus' uh, side. And uh, just finally, they, it's interesting how Nicodemus has to sort of a weird story as well, being reborn um, mm. and um, new life. And he's like, how do I do this? Mm. And, and in that text, uh, part of that is how Jesus speaks about there's a cost in new life. Um, so it, it doesn't just speak about this is a free new life for you, um, but he says, um, I will go to, to the cross for, for that. Mm. So I think there's some beauty. Sorry, a bunch. Mm. Agree. Okay, guys, let's continue the conversation. Let's have some coffee, and uh, we'll see you again next week. And God bless you. <laughs>